I mean, I was a really nasty little girl. Sally Ann dared to speak out. I think that was her fatal mistake. I, mean, I wanted to make money and make plenty of it. She was perhaps the first great whistleblower. Fetishes were where all the money was. What did they pay for that privilege? Five hundred dollars an hour. One of the problems with Sally is that um, she was a raving drug addict. Oh, I suppose it's very possible I'm bad. But I'm good too. There's good in me too. So, well, Sal, I'm not home by six o'clock. You know, they've killed me. It was like she was on a mission. <laughs> and she was strong. She'd become a high-profile target. I think she was aware that she was going to be murdered. I think she knew she was going to die. I could probably name four or five or six people that would have the potential and the motivation to kill Sally Ann. I thought this guy murdered her. I presume you have a personal view on who killed Sally Ann Huxted. I do. Who killed her? In life, she was larger than life. Sally Ann Huckstep turned heads. She was the prostitute turned informer who exposed the crooks and the crooked police who did business with them. It was the early 80s. It was the cross in Sydney. Sally Ann named names. Characters like standover man, Nettie Smith and Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson, the man who gunned down the love of her life, Warren Lanfranchi. She told the courts and the media that her boyfriend had been set up and murdered, and her accusations didn't stop there. Overnight, it made her famous, but it also made her vulnerable, and she knew it. I knew Sally Ann Huckstep. She was attractive, sharp, vivacious, unreliable. And she had a terrible weakness for drugs, drama, and dangerous men. I'm Mike Willisey. In 1982, Sally Ann told me that she believed she would be murdered. Less than four years later, police pulled her body from a pond in Centennial Park. No one has been convicted of that crime, a crime it seems everyone predicted. In the early 80s, we were not able to show her story for legal reasons. But tonight, you'll see Sally Ann Huckstep tell her story in her own words. But now we add the final chapter. Who killed Sally Ann Huckstep? She is 17, she is pregnant, and she has already started her working life as a prostitute. This home movie of Sally Ann has not publicly been seen. It's the 70s. While other girls talked of puberty blues and wagging school, Sally Ann was selling her looks on the streets of King's Cross. And that's where she returned nearly a decade later to show me the life she had lived and survived. Sally Ann, what's your strongest memory of being a street girl on the cross? Parading up and down Darlinghurst Road, probably. It sounds very degrading. Did you see it like that? Yes. Even more so when you run into someone you went to school with or, um, you know, a friend of the family or... Did that happen? Oh, yes. Too often. What would you do? At first I used to hide. <laughs> but then after a while I just... I 
say hello and keep working. Uh, I become very hard. I mean, I, I, I really, I mean, I hated myself. I hated being a junkie. I, I found myself, I, I knew I was really slipping, sort of going uh, downhill very rapidly. And uh, I hated my clients. I hated the customers. So how did you act towards them? I was very rough. I wasn't very nice at all. I mean, I wouldn't let them touch me. They'd been drinking. I wouldn't even let them breathe on me. I mean, if they didn't get dressed quick enough, I used to just take their clothes and put them out in the corridor and make them get dressed up there. I mean, I was really nasty with the girl. The reasons for young girls to start selling their bodies and shooting heavy drugs in places like this are varied. Sally Ann's reason was almost too bad to be true. She says her boyfriend asked her to become a prostitute when she was 16. He was a thief and a heroin addict and he needed the money. She went firstly to a brothel in Kalgoorlie, Western Australia. Kalgoorlie brothels are remnants of a past era. The girls actually live in the brothels and are restricted in their movements about the town by a set of unwritten rules. Quite a place for a young teenager to start a career. Coming back here after 10 years is really hard. I forget the faces and the names and... The fan, I've never forgotten the fan. If you're a hooker, you've got to be very careful of uh, disease. I mean, because it puts you out of business and you don't make any money. So, um, clients used to come in and it, you'd put your light on and throw them under the light and check them for VD and assorted ailments. And this was the second most important place in the room. It's very hard to come back and face the beginning of all the bad times. Uh, coming back here stirs up so many mixed emotions in me. Uh, so I realised that um, I got my first taste of stability. What I, I mean, I felt really stable here. I had this terrible realisation to think that you found stability in a whorehouse. I was so young. You say, I was 17, you don't know anything about anything. Not much of a life for anyone, let alone someone so young. But not long afterwards, Sally Ann brought another life into the world. Sasha Huckstep was nine when I first met her. Her father was in jail at the time, and her mother was still battling her addiction to hard drugs. Yet Sasha was a disarmingly level-headed kid. Sasha, thanks for talking with me. Thanks. <laughs> I want to say one thing to you first, and it's very serious. If I ask you any questions that you don't want to answer, you just say to me, I don't want to answer that. And that'll be okay. Right? Okay, here we go. What do you think about people who break the law? Well, I think that they're doing the wrong thing, and, you know, well, I think they should go to jail as well, but... How about seeing your dad in jail? What do you think about that? Well, I think he has done the wrong thing, but I still care for him, and I, you know, I still love him, even though he has done the wrong thing. Say hello to Daddy for me, won't you? Yeah. Tell him that next week we'll bring him the sketchbooks. Yeah, and remember, you have to give me your autograph. <laughs> Sasha often visits her father, Brian, in jail. It's not of her doing, but jails, drug addicts and criminals have been a constant part of her life. Mummy, look what Daddy's book made for me. He made me this book. I like this one. He thinks I've got blue eyes. You well? Yeah. And he said, yeah, and I 
so he says that he's only going to be in here for another year, so hurry up with the sketchbook. Right, right. <laughs> Sally Ann's life drifted into the 80s. The change of decade brought no foreseeable change of fortune. It was the same story. Drugs supported by prostitution. Simple, hopeless. When I first started working up here, I was very eager. I mean, I wanted to make money and make plenty of it. And then as I became a worse junkie, as my habit got worse, and I started supplementing my habit by shooting up barbiturates. I started getting later and later. I'd come in at 11, 12, then it was 1 or 2 in the morning, and I was working through to uh, 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. People would be on their way to work, and I'd still be standing there. Sally Ann didn't have the will, or perhaps the inclination, to change her life. But then, lightning struck. Early in 1981, she arranged to buy some heroin. The dealer drove her to a safe place to test the quality. The rules are, you don't look at each other. They broke the rules. It was to be the beginning of a love affair which would change their lives. But in six months, he would be dead and she would begin a totally new life. When Sally Ann got into that car, she met Warren Lanfranchi, a violent man, 23 years of age. He'd been out of jail only months, but was already a major heroin dealer. He had a reputation as an enforcer. He used a baseball bat and often carried a gun. Sally Ann, tell me about Warren Lanfranchi. I thought he was a very horny guy. Is that all? No, no, Warren was... You know, personally, I was very attracted to Warren. He was... He, had, he, as a, he was almost schizophrenic. He had one persona that dealt with business matters, which came from his jail experiences, and he had another personality that was... Your lover? Different. Yes. So, he must have played some role in getting you off heroin. Yes, Warren was wonderful. And it was very easy to come off heroin. Warren wanted me to get off it. I found it very easy to get off it. Because you had a substitute? Because I felt fulfilled. I asked her if she thought Warren had any sense of morality when he bashed junkies. Yes, he had a jail code of morality. When a man pushes heroin and bashes people with baseball bats. No, but no, hold on. Warren didn't... Probably Warren only ever hit anybody with a baseball bat once or twice. You see, much has been made of Warren going out with baseball bats. That's not true. Certainly he used a baseball bat as a threat. Warren was pretty good with his fists. I mean, he didn't really need the baseball bat. The threat was usually enough. He, look, he gave them a lot of chances. Probably that a lot of other dealers wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been so tolerant. Would you have been violent? Possibly. Because it's the only thing that those people understand. But you were one of them. Yes, and, and you have to accept that uh, those are the rules. I think most people are sickened by violence, even if they're not associated with it at first hand. But you seem to have a tolerance for it. You really seem to accept it as being part of the scene. Well, it, it is part of the scene. I mean, it is something that you... It is, it's inevitable. Perhaps it was also inevitable that a man who lived by such violent rules would die the same way. This is Chippendale, a suburb of Sydney, and it was here on a Saturday afternoon 
in winter last year that Warren Lanfranchi, boyfriend of Sally Ann Huckstep, came to meet a senior policeman. He came around at a Dangar place with a policeman named Detective Sergeant Rogerson. He believed Rogerson was unarmed. Rogerson was not only armed with a pistol down the back of his trousers, but he had other police surrounding the area. In fact, he had one senior policeman behind a car just over there and armed with a shotgun. Rogerson and Lanfranchi walked up the lane together. But when Lanfranchi noticed that there was a policeman hiding with a shotgun, according to Rogerson, he panicked. He pulled out a small pistol, he pointed it at Rogerson, who then pulled his own service pistol and fired twice, killing Lanfranchi. Lanfranchi died somewhere along here in this ill-begotten lane called Dangar Place. Rogerson's version of events, a version backed up by colleagues and by the notorious criminal Nettie Smith, who claims he was there at the time. But none of these men expected what happened next. Lanfranchi's girlfriend, Sally Ann Huckstep, was about to drop a bombshell. He said, well, Sal, I'm not home by six o'clock. You know, they've killed me. Franchi was a small-time hood, a nobody. The man who shot him, Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson, was a highly decorated frontline cop. The inquest into the shooting may have been a non-event, except for Sally Ann. Sally Ann became the overnight sensation who upstaged the star cop. The media lapped up every detail as she gave her version of what happened that day. It was a Saturday. Sally Ann said she and Lanfranchi counted out $10,000 in their flat. They were both nervous. This was a dangerous plan. Lanfranchi knew Rogerson was after him. Sally Ann said Warren was going to attempt to pay him off with the 10,000 when they met in Chippendale later that day. But Sally Ann had a bad feeling. Warren's last words to me as he walked out the door were, I said to him, what time will you be home? Because I'm going to be worried about you. He said, well, Sal, I'm not home by six o'clock. You know, they've killed me. Sally Ann claimed in court that Lanfranchi did not carry a gun with him that day. Writer John Dale has read every headline and studied every court transcript in researching his biography of Sally Ann. This was 1981. She, she came forward and said that police not only murdered Lanfranchi, her lover, but they had stolen money from his corpse and planted the gun on him. And this is in a period when I don't think um, People weren't saying that, so just to come forward at that stage took a lot of courage. But courage alone would not win on her day in court. After all, it was her word against Rogerson, his police colleagues, and Nettie Smith. Up until the Lanfranchi inquest, officers like John Laycock looked up to Roger Rogerson as a model cop. But that perception changed when the coroner brought down his findings. In the Lanfranchi coronial inquiry, the coroner found that Rogerson did indeed shoot Lanfranchi, but he failed to add, in self-defence or in the line of duty. That's correct. What did that mean to you? It meant there was questions being asked. There were some cracks emerging in his armour then. 
Sally Ann had suddenly made life difficult for Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. For the first time, the mud was sticking, and he spent years trying to shake it off. Rogerson's career never recovered. There were more investigations, more humiliations, and eventually, jail for bank fraud. I'm innocent and I've been convicted on the perjured evidence of a criminal and a prostitute. When the Lanfranchi inquest was over, Sally Ann and Sasha were left to pick up the pieces of their turbulent lives once more. I loved Warren. I felt more for Warren than I've ever felt for any human being in my life. I would have accepted anything that Warren wanted. So how did you feel when Warren died? I was sad. Mummy was sad as well, but I got over it. The death of Warren Lanfranchi led Sally Ann to reassess her life. It was time to make some changes. After all, she had a young daughter to think about. What sort of a mother are you? Not a very good mother. Not a good mother now? Not ever a very good mother. Why? I'm not very maternal. I'm not into... Well, I'm just not a very... I'm not the standard good mother. I do what I think is best, and um, poor Sasha has to follow along behind me. I mean, she's seen me as a junkie. She knows what a junkie is. I used to hit up in front of her. She's come to the realities of life very quickly. Sasha, what do drugs mean to you? They're bad. Would you ever take drugs? No. What do you know about them? That they're very bad for people. What do they do to people? They can kill somebody. Sally Ann had become a celebrity. And with that came the chance for a fresh start, a new life. She wrote articles for Australian Penthouse magazine. There was even talk of a book based on her many and varied experiences. Some of them even stranger than fiction. Lady became a call girl, which means private work, uh, I suppose, a better class of client, and certainly a lot more money for a lot less work. Oh, it is, it's, but it's, it's, it's very hard work. See, I decided that um, fetishes were where all the money was. People who really want to indulge in something quite different usually have the money to pay for it. And um, it was interesting. It was quite fun, actually. So that was an aspect of prostitution that you enjoyed? Yes, I did. <laughs> I loved it. I had two clients. I used to dress up as babies. I used to put them in the bath. And These were grown men? Oh, yes. <laughs> well grown in their 40s. And um, I used to put them in the bath and put the rubber ducky in the bath with them and um, bath them and wash their hair in baby shampoo. I had special towels for, for them, you know, with lambs and things. And then um, I used to put nappies on them and have the formula ready and feed them bottles. It's very difficult trying to rock a 40-year-old man in your arms, but, but we, I sort of simulated something similar anyway. And, and, um, and they were great. They were, they were quite funny. What did they pay for that privilege? $500 an hour. This world of bizarre sexual fantasy was a safe haven for Sally Ann. Her own life had become a dangerous game. Five years after the shooting of her lover, she was still intent on revenge. And she'd learnt that the best way to get at her enemies was through the media. 
Superintendent John Laycock ran Task Force Snowy, which reopened the Sally Ann case years after she was murdered. Sally Ann dared to speak out. I think that was her fatal mistake. Do you think that she knew what she was doing? One of the problems with Sally is that um, she was a raving drug addict, and I think drugs were the driving force behind her, uh, so caution was thrown out the window. Early in 1986, Sally Ann moved into a flat with this woman, Gwen Beecroft. They quickly became friends. We would talk about our past, and that's how she would tell me about her loved one, uh, Warren Lanfranc, someone that she really adored. She, she loved him very much. And so um, that's when she told me about this hate that she had for Nettie Smith and Roger Rogerson. She wanted the public to know how dangerous these people were. I think she was playing a game. But the game was about to reach its fatal conclusion. Sally Ann Huckstep had survived her heroin addiction she survived the perilous life of a streetwalker and she had survived the shock and trauma of her lover being gunned down. She might have written her own ending for this story. There was a chance to start a new life. But someone else had a different ending in mind for Sally Ann. It didn't take long to identify the victim. One of the first policemen to the scene knew this was Sally Ann. She was well known to the police. It was February 1986, Centennial Park, Sydney. Patrick Power was the Crown Prosecutor in the Sally Ann Huckstep murder trial. Well, it was over here that the body actually got pulled out of the water, just over here by the table behind us there, Mike. And uh, it had been floating in the water and appears it was sort of somewhere in the middle of the pond up in the pond over there when it was first found. Her problems with heroin were well known, but this was clearly no drug overdose. Sally Ann was lured to this spot the previous night by someone she knew. She was then strangled and drowned. Doesn't it seem a bit odd that if you're going to set up a murder, that you would do it so close to a public road? Well, you've got to remember that Sally Ann used to come here to buy her drugs off Warren Richards. This apparently was a place where she used to buy the drugs from Richards. Warren Richards was known to police. He was a heroin dealer with connections to Nettie Smith and Sally Ann. Gwen Beecroft says a man called Warren rang Sally Ann's flat on the night of the murder. When the phone rang, she was actually in the shower, so she was in there having a shower, and I ran down the hallway to the phone. It was, I looked up, it was 5 to 11, and um, I called out to her. So Warren's on the phone and then she came out and half wet and tail run ahead and robe on and she answered the phone. She got off and she said, oh hell, you know, and started dressing out. She became hurried in a way that, that seemed as if she didn't want to go but she was made to go. Someone had told her to go somewhere, but something said on the phone that hurried her to get out of that flat fast. She was worried, and uh, 
I, I kept asking, I said, are you going to be all right? Are you all right? And she just wouldn't tell me anymore. She pushed past me and she just looked at me and she said, I'll be back in five minutes. And off she went and that was that. It wasn't until the following afternoon that Gwen received the news. Sally Ann was dead. I just had this feeling that those three men had something to do with her death. Sally Ann had walked on thin ice for many years. By the mid 80s, it seemed her enemies were starting to outnumber her friends. Sally Ann had made a lot of claims since the Lanfranchi inquest, and the public was starting to take notice. But Sydney's underworld regarded her as little more than a pest. But late in 1985, something happened that would make them regard her as more than a pest. Sally Ann became a police informant. She started working with two federal policemen. Now she was a serious threat to the cosy relationship between corrupt New South Wales police and organised crime. Two months later, she was dead. Do you think she was exposed by federal police officers? I think Sally Ann exposed herself. She'd become a high profile target. I could probably name four or five or six people that would have the potential and the motivation to kill Sally Ann. Sally Ann must have realised the danger she was getting herself into, perhaps even more than the two young federal policemen who appeared to be naive. For example, no attempt was made to conceal the fact that Sally Ann was an informant. She was seen in their company in the cross and at restaurants frequented by known criminals. And on one occasion, they actually brought her to Long Bay Jail in full view of the prisoners. They exposed her. And by early 1986, it was open season on Sally Ann. Towards the end, it might have got a bit shaky for her, for sure. Only a few weeks before her death, she wrote a letter to her husband saying to, for him to look after, or ex-husband, saying for him to look after Sasha if anything happened to her. The original investigating team concentrated their efforts on only one prime suspect, Nettie Smith, and yet they had surprisingly few leads. Remember, Sally Ann was a high profile target. The murder was committed in city parkland. Everyone was talking about it, but no one was coming forward. Eight years later, somebody finally talked, and that person was Nettie Smith himself. Nettie Smith was doing time for the murder of a tow truck driver. Over a period of weeks, Smith talked with his cellmate about his life and crimes. What he didn't know was that there was a device hidden in a computer monitor. It recorded every chilling word as Smith talked about the night Sally Ann Huckstep was murdered. Here are extracts from those taped conversations.
That must have been quite a revelation. It was. Here we had uh, first-hand admissible uh, material, we thought, which was um, capable of being put before a court. The police collected five digital audio tapes full of these detailed, explicit statements by Nettie Smith. On one tape, Nettie Smith actually said the police had overlooked the one piece of evidence that he said could have incriminated him. He said Sally Ann had scratched him in the struggle. There might be traces of his skin and blood under her fingernails. Sally Ann's nail clippings had sat in a jar from the first autopsy for nearly 10 years. They were now sent to London for DNA testing. And indeed, there were traces of someone else's DNA under the nails. It matched only 3% of the population. And that small minority included Nettie Smith. On the surface, it would have appeared at the time, here was the killer, Nettie Smith. Prima facie, yes. So you have legally taped claims by Nettie Smith to having killed Sally Ann, describing the killing in graphic, callous detail. You have DNA taken from the victim's fingernails, which matches only 3% of the population, including Nettie Smith. And you have motive. But when the jury returned with their verdict, they found the accused not guilty of the murder of Sally Ann Huckstep. Why? Because in their estimation, there was reasonable doubt. What went wrong? I don't think anything went wrong. It's um, a question of being able to put before a court the evidence we had. Obviously, evidence cannot be manufactured. Uh, it cannot be reinvented. We were stuck with what we had. We played by the rules and the jury went the other way. That's just a fact of life and we have to live with that. Um, that's just our system. If you're not a lawyer and you read, as I read, that Nettie Smith had made a taped confession to his cellmate that he had murdered Sally Ann Huckstep, weren't we entitled to presume that he had done it? Yes, but it's certainly not the first case when people have said things and then later on alleged to the court that they only said it to big note themselves as they say that they was trying to boast about their own achievements their own involvement in crime but of course what i said to the jury during the course of the trial was that smith of all people didn't need to big note himself and what of warren richards the man gwen beecroft believes called sally ann from her flat on the night of her murder clearly on that basis warren in some way was involved in getting Sally Ann out of the flat. But we had nothing else against Mr Richards except a sample of his blood which he supplied and which could not be matched to the material underneath the fingernails. You prosecuted Smith. You spent a lot of time on this. I know you came to a personal belief. What was it? Nettie Smith will have to live with himself. I presume you have a personal view on who killed Sally Ann Huckstep? I do. Who killed her? Oh, we'll leave that to the next jury. The big fella upstairs. Today, Sally Ann's daughter is in her late 20s and she now has a child of her own. Sasha didn't want to be on camera this time around, but I can tell you, she's doing okay. I think a lot of kids of your age, Sasha, would see things on television, mm -hmm. like criminal behavior, mm -hmm. drugs and prostitution. And I think most children of your age would think, well, it only happens on television, it's not really real. Yeah. What do you think about that? 
Well, it's it's real. Well, it well, it's real. Just that I think it's really bad how people do things like that. I'm sure I'd never do anything like that. Hopefully, she's she's learnt enough from my experiences to sort of fear off and. Uh, go in the right direction, whichever of them. Given your periods of irresponsibility over the years, does it surprise you that she appears such a well-balanced child? Yes, it does, really. It would be wrong to try and paint Sally Ann as some sort of crusader for justice. She was no saint. Sally Ann wanted revenge. There was a score to settle with the men she believed had conspired to murder the love of her life, Warren Lanfranchi. The New South Wales Police Service underwent the biggest clean-out in its history in the years following Sally Ann's death. So, whatever her motives, Sally Ann made a difference. She was perhaps one of the first, if not the first, great whistleblower. For perhaps her own reason, she spilled the beans on what she saw as corruption within the New South Wales Police Force. I think Sally Ann's episode uh, with Lan Franchi and the ICAC inquiries and the Royal Commissions that flowed really were a watershed for the New South Wales Police. Sally Ann, I think, was, was fearless. She didn't care who she spoke out against or who to. Uh, I think she made her own death call by going public with the issue that she did. You gave us permission to talk with two psychiatrists that you've consulted, and you gave them permission to talk with us. Now, they both declined to talk on film, but one said, I won't talk with you about Sally Ann on film because all I could say is that she is bad. <laughs> I know, yes. I didn't like him very much either. <laughs> Did you know he would say that? Oh, yes. But you let us talk to him? Yes. I mean, we had a... I, look, I don't know one psychiatrist I've been to since I was 12 years old that's really done anything for me, except screw me up more. And he was the worst of them. <laughs> Is it possible you're bad? Oh, I suppose it's very possible I'm bad. But I'm good too. There's good in me too. So back to the conflict. It just, I suppose it just depends on which side uh, wins out. Next Tuesday night at 10, we invite you to some of the most lavish weddings of the year. Join Vanessa Williams, Cindy Crawford, Celine Dion, Raquel Welsh, Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20 and more as they share their wedding videos, photo albums and intimate details of their special day. Joanna Griggs hosts Celebrity Weddings next Tuesday night. World's Most Shocking Moments Caught on Tape premieres next.